Hello, everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city, Hollywood. It is absolutely directly uh, connected. In fact, your example about the Catholic Church is spot on. Uh, not only did the Catholic Church not want people to have direct access to the Bible, but they uh, deliberately uh, stopped that access by centralizing, concentrating libraries and therefore books uh, uh, among their control, but also by uh, uh, limiting access to education, uh, giving education to monks and priests, but but far less education to the lay people out there. It was Martin Luther who came on the scene and said, you know what, you should read the Bible yourself. And for that, you need two things. One, you actually need to have the Bible in your language. So he translated the Bible into the vernacular German. And second, he said, we need to have a technology that makes the Bible accessible to all of you. And that was the printing press. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for our show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger, the Professor of Internet Governance and Regulation at the Oxford Internet Institute, University of Oxford. Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Now, at the time of the, this particular interview, we're learning that Sheryl Sandberg is stepping down as the CEO of Meta, Facebook's parent company. And according to Politico, and I quote, critics blame her for Facebook's relentless struggles with hate speech and misinformation on this platform. And in the words of Angelo Caruso, president of Media Matters for America, during Sheryl Sandberg's 14-year tenure at Meta, the company's social media platform devolved into cesspools of disinformation, racism, misogyny, violent conspiracy theories, and alt-right organizing. She knew this was a problem, and like the CEO, she failed to act, she said. Now, there's an interesting aspect that some of the articles have pointed out is that in the early years of Facebook, the CEO was happy to delegate areas that he didn't find interesting to Sandberg, such as governance, regulation, and policy. Why is free, unfeathered access to information so critical to our society and the foundation of democratic decision making? Well, at the end of the day, what we all need to do every day hundreds of times is to make decisions. And as we make decisions, we need to think what is uh, what differentiates a good decision from a bad decision. And one crucial element is that we have uh, appropriate information, appropriate evidence, facts to base our decisions on. Now, if all the data, all the facts are centralized or concentrated among a few platforms, then that is very detrimental, not just to democracy uh, and uh, democratic decision-making, but to decision-making more generally. People will make bad decisions if they don't have the information that they need. And again, I think what you're referring to is this, uh, again, going back to the social media example that I I mentioned earlier is this notion of creating echo chambers or worse, misinformation or disinformation becomes the norm. Now, during the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church actively suppressed education so that the masses needed to depend on the church to read and interpret the Bible. I wonder how is access to data directly related to power and control? It is absolutely directly uh, connected. In fact, your example about the Catholic Church is spot on. Uh, Not only did the Catholic Church not want people to have direct access to the Bible, but they uh, deliberately Uh, stop that access by centralizing, concentrating libraries and therefore books uh, uh, among their control, but also by uh, uh, limiting access to education, uh, giving education to monks and priests, but, but far less education to the lay people out there. It was Martin Luther who came on the scene and said, you know what, you should read the Bible yourself. And for that, you need two things. One, 
you actually need to have the Bible in your language. So he translated the Bible into the vernacular German. And second, he said, we need to have a technology that makes the Bible accessible to all of you. And that was the printing press mm -hmm. uh, that came around. And these two things combined uh, created the Reformation movement because people said, you know what? I want to read the Bible myself. I want to find out what the right path to God is myself. That was empowerment. Absolutely empowerment. And that's really what we're talking about is exactly that. Now, in your upcoming book, Access Rules, Freeing Data from the Big Tech for a Better Future, the central question of the book is how do we legitimize and limit the power of knowledge? Yes. You, yeah. uh, yes, that is, um, that is the fundamental point there. You know, when we go back 250, 300 years, the beginning of the Enlightenment, the hope was that we could make better rational decisions based on facts and, and those facts would be accessible uh, to uh, many people and therefore everybody would benefit uh, from that, uh, if you want, knowledge dividend. Um, Tycho de Brahe was a, a Danish uh, astronomer and, um, and, and he was very meticulous in collecting data about the planets and so forth. Um, and he had for years done that. Uh, he had an apprentice called Johannes Kepler and Johannes Kepler um, saw the data, basically saw the value of it, stole it, not to make it necessarily uh, accessible to everybody, but to look at the data and to see what he could gain out of the data. And he developed out of it a model, a model of planetary motion, which he then made public. And these are the Kepler laws that today are still used to actually put satellites in space. And um, if he hadn't taken that data and uh, through uh, incorporating the gist of it into the Kepler laws, make it accessible to humanity, we would have no satellites today. Well, again, for someone who is a scholar like yourself, an academic and a researcher, clearly what you do on a daily basis and, of course, the span of your career, productive career, is really been about exactly what you're talking about, making this information and knowledge readily more available. But the challenge is there's a barrier. And I, I think, you know, it's something that I've been frustrated for most of my life is there's so much great research-based, empirical research that's being done on an academic and research level, but doesn't really come over to the mainstream, or if it does, certainly it gets politicized or it gets uh, kind of polarized. How do we start to get information in a way that's unfiltered? Well, first of all, it's hard to, to have truly unfiltered information. Information is always filtered one way or the other because of the sensors that we're using uh, that, that are sensitive to a particular wavelength or a particular uh, frequency. But, but we can make significant steps towards a more open environment. And we are actually doing that. I mean, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, most academic publications were published in, in journals that you needed to subscribe to and pay thousands and thousands of dollars. So only very elite um, uh, educational institutions could actually subscribe to them. Then we had the open access movement and lots and lots of academic journals became open access so that the, the journal articles uh, mm -hmm. became easily available. But as you rightly point out, that gives us sort of the, the research result with the slant. Can we get the, the, the input as well? And that is the next step, more and more researchers not only are making their research results freely available and accessible, but also the data that they collected so that others could take a critical look at it, perhaps come up with a different analysis, perhaps come up with a criticism that then the original authors can, can take on board or look at or investigate. This is all part of what is called the scientific method. And it requires that we not just um, make accessible the outcomes, uh, but but also the data that we collect. Now, one of the assertions you make is that uh, access to information also improves and accelerates innovation. And certainly, the internet is is clearly one of the biggest example of that. And specifically, if you look at things like GitHub, open source, as well as just other re readily available libraries that people can leverage. Uh, can you elaborate on how it actually helps innovation? Absolutely. Um, 
you know, uh, Schumpeter uh, pointed out that innovation is really, if, if, if I may use my own words, to take an idea and transform it into a product to uh, translate it into the market or put it into the market. Uh, and so what is required for innovation uh, is an idea, but also that transformation from an idea into a product. And that is where uh, the proverbial rubber hits the road. In the past, we needed the idea and then we needed to just sort of productize it, trial and error. Uh, the, Mr. Dyson of the, the, the vacuum cleaner uh, famously said that he had thousands of versions of his vacuum cleaner that he tinkered with. But that was yesterday. That was how we took an idea and translated into a product yesterday. Today, that's no longer sufficient in many areas. In order to take an idea and make a product out of it, we need a lot of training data to create algorithmic models or machine learning models. And the massive training data really is the necessary requirement, the necessary ingredient to transform an idea into an innovation. And startup companies may have great ideas, may have sufficient capital, but if they don't have access to data, they just, they can't progress. Now on that example of machine learning is that uh, if you speak with a lot of the IP holders or startups that are specializing in this is that uh, they will make the argument that really the techniques, uh, the specific machine learning or neural networks that they're doing isn't really the core IP or the trade secret. It's really the way they're ingesting and interpreting the data but if everybody has access to the same data sets, uh, including the readily available public domain, but also some of the private ones, does that start to dissipate or water down the potential IP um, and the protection that they can have around their trade secrets? I don't think so at all. First of all, we need to understand that there is no ownership right in data. Uh, the, uh, the founding fathers of the United States uh, put together a great constitution. They uh, made sure that we have intellectual property protection in there uh, for, for great ideas for products, but they didn't have intellectual property protection in there for data uh, mm. because data is a reflection of reality. You can't own reality. Reality just exists. And so um, uh, we, we don't have a, a ownership right in data. Do we need one? Well, not necessarily. Uh, we are collecting already a lot of data. Some think that about 80 to 85% of the data and have surveys to back that up, uh, that we are collecting, 85% of that data is not even used once. So we collect a lot more data than we're ever using, uh, which is not efficient uh, and not sustainable. Um, but, but then uh, when we, when th those companies that take the data and use it, they take the raw data and then they, they organize it. They choose the particular machine learning model. They choose the starting parameters. They basically set the boundary conditions. Nobody is taking that away from them. That is uh, a, a very significant element of ingenuity, of human ingenuity that goes into it and continues to goes into it. And of course, then there is the idea to start with. I mean, there is a, a, a company um, in, in Europe uh, that uh, has uh, developed an app um, so that um, people on the subway uh, can play the app uh, and shorten the time on the right. But in the background, the app, uh, collects vibration data. Uh, and that vibration data is sent to the, uh, to the company that operates the subway so that they know when they need to actually smooth out the tracks. That's a brilliant idea of how you can collect data and, 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 and use data. But the idea is the ingenuity. Uh, it's not the data. The data is not that important. Yeah, and I, I think that's a valid point. It really comes down to the methodology. That's where the, the tree circuit is in. Now, let me go back a, a step here. We've been talking about open data, but if you could help define exactly what that is and why do advocates uh, really you know, strongly advocate for, for open data? Open data basically means data that is easily accessible 
to practically everyone. We can, we can think of, of, of some limited constraints that you need to have um, technical, a certain technical proficiency, for example, to access it. But basically open data means um, it's out there, there's an API, you can access it. Um, there is all kinds of subgroups, if you want, of open, open data, open government data. Government collects an enormous amount of data. It's our data. Government is, uh, is essentially um, the notary uh, of, of, our, of our data, the trust uh, of, uh, of the, uh, the, the data that we entrusted uh, government with. Uh, and so... Um, we could argue that we have to have access to that data. We should be able to use it and to gain insights from it. And, and that is what open data movements over the last 20 years have pushed for and made significant headway in the United States as well as around the world. So the open data initiative or the movement that you're referring to has been making very good progress. But at the same time, if you really analyze it at the detail level, there's still a lot of data sets that's really not being readily available. Everything from the fact that it's sitting in repositories that's just very difficult to access because they're legacy systems, to the fact that it's commingled or it's difficult to anonymize and, and maintain the GDPR compliancy. So how do we ensure that more of that public domain public data becomes readily available. And then we haven't talked about the corporate corporations or the private sector. So a lot of the corporations from a mindset, because the legacy is they used to have uh, in on-premise servers before they went to cloud. And when they went to cloud, they prefer private versus public domain or public cloud. Uh, so there's a kind of a mindset that their data and their special recipe is so unique that they have to hold on to it. So how do how do we start to help them to loosen up so that they can open up some of that to others as well? Great two questions. Let me address the first one. What can we do in order to to to, to further bring along uh, open uh, government data? Um, part of it is uh, resource constraints. Uh, government. Uh, agencies, especially at the state and local level, are greatly resource constrained. They don't have the technical tools available or the expertise to make the data accessible, even if they wanted to. Uh, and, and, and that is something that we, we can hopefully address uh, by, by more standardized tools that can be uh, a, a little bit easier uh, put in place and at relatively low cost. Um, there, there is still some ha low hanging fruit, um, but it, it does require attention. Uh, the other uh, problem, of course, that you alluded to, and that is uh, personal data. Um, and that, that then uh, is uh, confidential on some level, uh, maybe uh, beholden uh, GDPR uh, or, or, or other privacy mandates. Um, for, for this kind of data, we have now tools available to depersonalize such data sets. It's not perfect. Uh, and by depersonalizing a data set, you take value out of it. No question about it. But there is still a lot of residual value after depersonalization. Depersonalization is not perfect. With a great amount of effort, you could repersonalize. But for a lot of not that sensitive data sets, uh, that's uh, an em eminent strategy to, to follow. However, government agencies really haven't, haven't tackled that. A different story is on the corporate sector where the problem is less resource constraints uh, than strategy. The mindset is that data is like the new oil, you know, like it's a resource that I need to put in the basement and wait for the price to go up. And then I, 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 I win, I have extra profit which is totally ridiculous because the value of data lies not in uh, its residual value in the basement. There it just rots away and gets outdated. The value lies in using and reusing it for multiple purposes over and over again. So the value is in the use and the utilization of it. And that means if I can't utilize it, I should try to find somebody else to utilize it. Maybe I can get a cut of it, um, but, uh, but overall, that drives insight. If I just have it in the basement, not do anything with it, then in fact, I am shortchanging not only myself, but I'm shortchanging all of society uh, from gaining insights from the data that I have. Yeah, I think you make a very 
good, great point, especially in the in, in the current condition of the Internet of Things, where you have ubiquity and incredible uh, variety, velocity, and and, um, uh, and and other aspects of different types of data that's coming in from different sources. Is that you know really a lot of the corporations have a data dark lake uh, issue where either they're just got all this data they don't know what to do with, and in the process they're incurring cloud costs, storage costs, or they're starting to kind of limit what they actually pull. So there's a lot of data that's still on the edge or at the device level that hasn't been really synthesized for meaningful purposes. Uh, you started to allude to this, but the data exchange, data brokerage, is there a system in place for corporations to actually facilitate it so that if there's data that has some value, uh, but rather than just keeping in the basement, they can actually start to monetize it? Well, um, uh, contractually, that can, be, uh, that can be achieved. Companies can license data sets to other companies. Um, and that's a relatively straightforward process. Um, there's multiple ways to, the, to do that. You can do it directly with the data or you can do it through some, some intermediate steps um, so that, uh, the, that the data is licensed or that you're somehow uh, create another layer of protection around it. Um, there is a, another uh, way that has been proposed and that is data markets. So that we have markets on which data is being uh, supplied by companies and then demanded by, by others. Um, interestingly enough, data markets have not been successful. Uh, and the reason why they have not been successful is in part because data is like a video or a, a, a piece of music. It's an experience good of sorts. It, if you look at it from the outside, you don't know what you're getting or what value it has. And because you don't know that, it's very challenging to put a price tag on it. We already know that from you know, putting a price tag on a movie or putting a price tag on a book. The price tags of, for a book, you know, $20 or $25, it's totally artificial because uh, there are books that I gain a lot of value out of far beyond $25 and, and would pay more as well. And there are books that, that are not worth $25 even. Um, so uh, markets normally have a really good mechanism price to, uh, to uh, adjust supply and demand, but with data markets, that doesn't work very well. Uh, and the additional problem is of mm -hmm. course, that data isn't exclusive. Uh, if I have data and I license it, to, license it to one company, I can license it to another company and to another company. And that doesn't necessarily reduce the value for the first company, uh, particularly if they, if they use it, if they use the data for different, very different purposes. Uh, so in that sense, the market as a coordination and allocation mechanism isn't particularly well suited um, for data. And, and that is one of the reasons why data markets haven't been successful. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, and again, I think these are some of the struggles that I haven't been able to quite crack myself. So thank you for elaborating on that. Now, you start to allude to it, but let's get into a little bit more specific around the difference between data use regulation versus data protection regulation, just so it's clear in the listeners' minds. Yes. Um, what, what, is, what is quite interesting and intriguing is that we, we often talk about GDPR, we often talk about data protection and privacy, but different people mean different things and different laws or different statutes mean different things. Um, uh, in, in the past 20 years or so, or 25 years, data protection legislation has mostly focused uh, on informed consent. That is on providing people with information about what the data is being used for at the moment of collecting the data and then getting them to consent it. And once they have consented, they basically have lost complete control over it, more or less. Um, that is a, a, a formalistic bureaucratic model, a hoop that companies have to uh, get through in order to get the data. And large companies can do it more easily than smaller companies helping the large platforms more so than the smaller ones, uh, but it doesn't instill trust and ownership and empowerment in the individuals either. 
the individuals look at it and say, you know, what, what kind of choice do I have? I have to click OK anyway and consent if I want a particular service. So they feel they got the short end of the stick. Uh, it's a bureaucratic process for the companies that only helps the large ones, not the medium and small ones, not the startups. So we look at this and we say, wow, we have a, a data protection machinery that doesn't really further the, the goal, the ultimate goal of, of individual empowerment or, 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 or protecting the value of privacy. So we really need to move away from that and say, um, data needs to be used. And if data is used and then harms people, causes damage, then that damage needs to be mitigated and companies that are responsible for causing that damage have to take on that responsibility. That might sound very abstract, but, but it's actually a mechanism that we are extremely familiar with in, in, in daily lives. Um, when, you know, when we're in a car and the braking system just suddenly stops working, it's not our fault that we cause an accident. It of course is the car manufacturer's fault that, that built a, a, um, a braking system into the car that doesn't function uh, correctly. Uh, similarly, when we go to a, a supermarket, we don't bring our chemistry lab with us to test the, 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 the groceries there um, uh, and, and make sure uh, that they're digestible and that they don't cause any illnesses. In fact, we assume that there are processes in place, that there is oversight in place, that there is responsibility and accountability in place that takes care of that problem. And so uh, that we can um, shop uh, trusting uh, the, that the, the, the groceries are perfectly uh, fine to eat. We need the same thing for uh, personal data. So we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, reference to machine learning and more broadly artificial intelligence. And when we think about artificial intelligence in the context of black box, so let's say there's algorithms that's been developed using certain sets of data sets that determines who gets a mortgage approved or not. But because of the way it's been developed, and it's kind of a fuscated data set and methodology. Uh, let's say that there are disproportionate amount of minorities, let's say African-Americans that do not get their mortgage uh, applications approved. And if in fact there's actual harm that's caused, how should that be then dealt with from a policy? Well, the um, first of all, it's important to understand that um, Lots of uh, governments around the world are playing with regulating artificial intelligence at this point in time. Um, the European Union is one big block that is really uh, drafting, as I speak, an AI law. Um, but fortunately, this AI law is actually uh, based on risk assessment and risk management. And that's a good thing. It's a good starting point. Because what we want is to be able to try things out experiment, make mistakes, learn from them, and not make them again. That requires transparency, that requires uh, a, a culture also of openness of, of, of making mistakes, um, so that we can avoid making those mistakes again. Um, and uh, therefore, what we need is accountability, but accountability in a way uh, that, uh, that helps companies to solve the problems and, and correct the errors that they have built in. So when you do a risk uh, um, management and risk assessment um, uh, exercise, then you list up the risks and you try to come up with, with mitigation strategies. Should you then discover that there is a risk that you uh, incorrectly failed to put in, yet then you need to uh, rejig your risk assessment and then put in another mitigation um, element uh, in, in your uh, system. Um, all of that is sort of a bit of trial and error, um, trying to keep the risk incremental, the incremental risk relatively low, but also uh, taking on incremental accountability. Uh, if you let me, uh, then I'd like to contrast this um, the situation uh, with the aviation industry on the one hand side and the medical profession on the other hand. In the aviation industry, when pilot makes mistakes and they make mistakes all the time, uh, they are told that if they're frank and open and direct to the investigators, 
they will in general not be held liable for their mistakes because we want to learn from them and we want to create better systems. In the medical field, the doctors are told if you make a mistake, don't tell anybody because otherwise you and the hospital is going to be liable uh, for millions and millions of dollars um, and, and so hush it up. But that means, as we have seen in the medical field, that learning and avoiding mistakes is stunted. That's not what we need in artificial intelligence and machine learning because we're just at the beginning of the curve. Um, and we have a lot of mistakes ahead of us that we are gonna make. So what we need is a process that makes those mistakes transparent, that we can learn from them. And that is a risk management uh, and a risk-based approach uh, far more so than, for example, a precautionary principle approach. Mm -hmm. well, well, well put. Now, how do we uh, rationalize the current movement of the Internet of Internet 3.0 or simply referred to as Web3? Uh, are we being misled to think that blockchain or other underlying technologies can decentralize the strang stranglehold of power and control of data by the big uh, data giants? Yes, unfortunately. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that um, the power of those platforms is structural, not in the technology, but in the, in the organizational structure and the business model in a way that they are following. Uh, and just take AT&T if you, if you want um, and, the, and the history of AT&T. Uh, AT&T was huge in the 1980s. There was a antitrust investigation. AT&T was broken up into baby bells and so forth, but the underlying concentration dynamic wasn't addressed. Fast forward 30 years later or 35 years later and AT&T is bigger than ever before. Because we haven't addressed the underlying structural problem of the business model and the concentration of data. Now, go back into the 1950s, AT&T was already an antitrust problem then, but the Department of Justice stepped in and said, this time around, we're not gonna break you up. What we do is we take all the patents, all the knowledge of Bell Labs and making them open access. Everybody in the United States can use them from now on, including the patents for transistors, for microwaves and all that. That in the early 1950s in one fell swoop ignited Silicon Valley. It was the starting point for lots of startups to say, now we can do it. We don't have to license it. License the knowledge from AT&T. They can't hold on to that stranglehold. We can now do it. Today, we need to do the same thing, not so much for patents and knowledge, but for data. Final question is, um... For those that are listening, they're probably thinking for themselves as an individual from an empowerment perspective, uh, what are some things that they need to be mindful of or steps that they can take to make sure that open data sharing is something that becomes more widely adopted? One of the things that, that I think startup companies can do is to say, we are, if we are collecting data, is there a way by which we can share that data perhaps with other startup companies or pool that data so that with, with other startups com companies so that we actually grow the pie? Another interesting idea in the United States that I've seen in the, in the biotech sector is for VCs to come in and say, okay, we'll give you the money, but in return, you not only have to make open access the, the research results, but also the data that you collected so that other companies in the biotech sector can stand on the shoulders of giants, so to speak, can, can, can benefit from, from what you did. You're still getting the patent on, on the drugs that you are producing and so forth, uh, and, and you can earn all the money back that we gave you and much more. But by making the data accessible, we're also contributing uh, to other companies' success and therefore uh, to the progress of society. Perfect. So on that note, I have been joined by Professor Victor Meyer Schoenberger. Thank you for joining today. It's been a great conversation. Thank you very much, Scott. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.